Good morning. During this week, when I was asked to pray for divine calling, our appointments, I was really dealing with the meaning of those two, of that particular word, appointment. But I decided to change to what I wanted to say. God appoints Moses and Aaron to lead his people. Today, he uses the Holy Spirit through his people to select the leaders. And here in this particular church, we witness his work while the nominating committee select the people that will lead his congregation. While you look at the list of those who have been chosen to lead, let's keep it in mind so that they will be influential in our lives and their particular lives. I would like to share with you 1 Corinthians 26 to 30. And it reads, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were a noble birth. But God chose the foolish thing of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and these pins things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may be both before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, a righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Today, while I invite you to pray with me, let's remember where we have been, and today we have been called to serve our God, to serve the powerful, merciful God, that he has in control everything. He's the only one that's leading this world. And let's not forget that. Shall we pray with me? Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to serve you. Thank you because you have called us from different places to serve you. We ask, Father, that you give us wisdom, understanding, and we also can relate with each other with love and understanding. Father, we are in a world that really needs you. Let us be a light to those that are surrounding us, our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones. And Father, this morning I ask specifically that you be with Pastor Jordan. While he brings that magnificent call to Job and to remind us that you are in charge, no one else. Thank you for that, in Jesus' name, amen. Do you know what it means to begin a story in media res? Have you heard this before? No one? Okay, so you're gonna learn something new today. So in media res, so this is a Latin phrase for in the midst of things. So a book or a movie that begins in media res will plop the, the viewer or the reader into a scene from the middle of the story. And then it will rewind to go back and tell you the story from the beginning. 
The reader or the viewer is intrigued by that scene that they saw, and they are eager to see how the rest of the story plays up to that moment. That's what in media res means. I want to begin the story of Job in media res for you. So imagine with me, Job is sitting in sackcloth and ashes. He is covered in sores, and this is what he says in Job chapter 30. Terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as by the wind. My prosperity has passed away like a cloud, and now my life ebbs away. Days of suffering grip me. Night pierces my bones. My gnawing pains never rest. He throws me into the mud, and I am reduced to dust and ashes. I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. Talk about rock bottom. Shame, uh, pain, the silence of heaven. If you have ever asked, why God or why me, then there is a book in your Bible that is meant directly for you, a story that wrestles with these difficult questions. Now, we're going to get to this part of the story eventually. Today, we're going to rewind, and we're going to get the story started. To do that, I just want to start by giving you an overview of what this book is. You can turn to the book of Job in your own Bible, if you'd like to, as we do. Uh, First of all, the, the main character's name is Job, looks like Job, it's pronounced Job. I'm sure there's many people who are new to the Bible that turn to this book expecting some career advice, and they're going to be wildly disappointed. So Job belongs to a section of your Bible that we call wisdom literature. And this is one of the most important things to note about this book right from the start. This is not a book like the books of Ruth or Esther that just tell you the story of a person. Now, we do learn the story of Job in this book, but the style of how it is written is meant to engage the reader differently. So wisdom literature in your Bible primarily includes what three books? Job is one of them. So Psalms has a lot of it, but yes, it has a lot of wisdom literature in it. Proverbs was one of them, and the other one, Ecclesiastes. Yeah, so those are the main three. Psalms had a lot of wisdom literature in it as well, though. So these writings grapple with the foundational questions of life. And in the case of Job, it's how do you make sense of suffering and the goodness of God? Now notice, this question is not something that has appeared on the scene with the rise of modern skepticism. For thousands of years, believers have wrestled with this issue. Why do bad things happen to good people? This question sits in the minds of many who read the story of Job. Now, I think that that's actually not the best question to ask of this story, but we're going to get there in a moment. Now, another thing to note about Job is that this is one of the most literary books in your Bible. One of the most literary books. What does that mean? So the design of this book, the vocabulary that it uses, the poetic style of writing that's in there, all of these features are highly sophisticated. This is not written to be a dry, matter-of-fact record of Job's life and conversations. It's all very elevated. Now, just because it's literary does not mean that it is fictional. Now, there's all sorts of debates on this, and ultimately this conversation is neither here nor there. I believe that this is a true story of a real person named Job and his suffering. However, it is told in a very elevated style of wisdom literature. Why? Because it's trying to explore difficult questions of life. Now, because of this style and this genre, this book is meant to be meditated on slowly, not sped through like a novel. The way that the book is laid out is you have very short chunks of narrative at the beginning, And at the very end, you've got a prologue and an epilogue. But the bulk of the book are these long poetic dialogues where Job and his friends and then eventually God lay out theological and philosophical positions. Now, most of the time, these poetic chapters are just skimmed through. A few verses get referenced here or there. But we treat the tiny narrative sections as the most important parts of the book. And this is actually the exact opposite of what the author intends. The most significant material is actually what comes at the center. The narrative parts are there to just set the scene and wrap up the story at the end. So, in weeks to come, we're going to dive into that bulk of the middle of the middle 
the poetic stuff. Today, we're just going to work our way through the prologue, though. So if you're there in Job chapter 1, we're going to start right from the start of the story. Job 1, verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. So I should say that the book of Job is pretty difficult to place geographically and chronologically. We don't exactly know where the land of Uz is, (laughs) uh, nor do we know when this story is taking place. The general consensus is that Job is one of the oldest characters in your Bible. He's a contemporary to patriarchs like Abraham. Um, I think that's probably right. There is some disagreement about when this book was written. Uh, Did Moses write this? Was this a story that was passed down orally through generations and then centuries later someone else wrote it down? Uh, It's not really important for understanding the message of this book, but there's debate on this. But we've got Job here. He is blameless and he is upright. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. He also had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. And if you keep reading, you see that Job will offer sacrifices for his 10 children after they throw birthday parties, just in case any of them have sinned. Job fears God, and he is healthy and wealthy. And in the minds of many people, this is how it's supposed to work. Piety should lead to prosperity. I mean, if God is in control, then he should reward his faithful followers. And those who disobey God, they should be sick and poor. But that's not how life works, is it? We're about to read the most extreme example of someone's life souring for no good reason whatsoever. So we're going to leave Job's life on earth, and we're going to cut to God's throne room in heaven. One day, the sons of God, your Bible might say angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. Your Bible might actually have a little footnote there next to the word Satan, letting you know that this is actually not a proper name, it's a title. So this character is introduced as the Satan, the Satan, actually. It's a word that means the accuser, the adversary, the hostile one. Now, I'm fine using the name Satan as we keep telling this story, but that title actually does help us to paint who this figure is, right? He's there to oppose. He's there to point fingers. He's there to challenge. Now, what exactly is this scene that we are reading about here? We've got heavenly beings that are all gathering together. They're going to start reporting on their activity. What's going on? So this group is often called the divine council. Think of it like God's heavenly cabinet. We read about this in a number of places in the Old Testament, Psalm 82, Psalm 89. There's a really interesting story about this in 1 Kings 22 with a prophet named Micaiah. Look that one up this afternoon. What is this divine counsel? Well, even though God is sovereign and he doesn't need these divine beings to help him do his job, for some reason, God chooses to delegate authority in some way. Now, we could do a whole Bible study just on this one theme here and have some really interesting conversations because this is a very underappreciated piece of the biblical worldview. But we're talking about Job, so we're gonna stay there. Verse seven, the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Wow, there's no one like him on earth. He is blameless and upright. He's a man who fears God and shuns evil. And Satan here sees an opportunity to call God's statement into question. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, meaning, do you really believe that Job follows you out of the goodness of his heart? Haven't you put a hedge around him and his household and everything that he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land, but I dare you, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. So what is Satan claiming here? He's saying that God is He's buying loyalty from humans. No one would worship you if they weren't being bribed to. 
These humans, they're just gold diggers. Take away the gifts and you'll see that they don't actually really want the giver. Now, in some cases, unfortunately, Satan would be right. If the blessings of life were to dry up, so would many people's faith. But Job is different. He's God's servant. He is upright. He is blameless. So the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Okay, so it is right here that we hit our first big obstacle in this story, don't we? Why would God do this? Job is innocent. I mean, God even said so. So why would God engage in this wager? I mean, I spent many years wincing at this part of my Bible. I mean, how are you supposed to read this and not feel suspicious of God? Am I really supposed to surrender my life to a God who is willing to ruin it on a whim? If any of those questions resonate with you, if this part of the story leaves you unsettled, good, good. That is exactly the headspace that you are supposed to be in as you read this book. Because eventually, Job is going to feel this way as well. But before we move on here in the story, let's register a couple of things that are important. First of all, did you notice that God tweaked Satan's request slightly? So let's go back to what Satan asked. Now stretch out your hand and strike everything that he had. What does Satan want? Yeah, he wants God to strike Job's life. And what did God say in response? Fine, but you do it. So so God might authorize this suffering, but he won't author it. Now that is just a cute little pastoral phrase, and for most of us, that's not going to be all that helpful. I mean, if Satan is the one specifically doing it, fine, but God is still complicit in this. So what really is the difference? I hear that, But I want to let you know that this distinction really, truly matters. The Bible does not teach that evil comes from God. Even if God allows certain things to happen, tragedies and disasters and diagnoses do not originate in God's imagination or initiative. Now, can God do acts of judgment on people? Sure, he can. But that's not the story that we're reading about here. There is an enemy who is at work, and he ultimately is the one to blame. Now, that does not brush aside the frustration we might feel of why God would allow this to happen to Job, but it does reframe this story in a really crucial way. Satan's hand is afflicting Job's life. Now, let's think about the the nature of this test. Who is the one trying to prove something here? Yeah, is it God or is it Satan? It's Satan, right? God doesn't call Satan in in order to prove a point. Satan is the one who raises the challenge. God knows from the start that Job is going to pass this test, so he doesn't need to play a game in order to test Job's loyalty. This is Satan's game. Now, connected to this, an even more important question. Who is on trial here? Hmm. Is it Job? Yeah, it might seem like it's Job on first reading here. God and Satan are arguing over who Job is truly loyal to, so they set up this test to see how faithful Job will be. But if that's what you think is happening in this story, if you think Job is the one on trial, then you're going to walk away with a really bad taste in your mouth from this book. Job is not the one on trial here. I think I heard it. Who is? God is the one on trial. You see, the real question of this book is not why do bad things happen to good people? That question is all over these pages, but by the end, no one ever really gets an answer to this question. Even we, the readers, who get to see some of what happens in heaven, 
we still don't know why God would allow this to happen to Job by the end. We're just as confused as Job is. If this is the question that you come with, you're going to walk away feeling frustrated. The real question of this book is, can God be trusted? Can God be trusted? When life turns sour and bad things happen for no good reason, can God still be trusted? So Satan's challenge is that Job will not trust God if things take a turn for the worse. So the crux of the question is not about human suffering, it's about God's justice. That there are cosmic stakes coursing through these pages. What Adventists call the great controversy sits right at the center of this challenge. Is God truly just? Is God worthy of trust? That's the question at the heart of this book. So as we keep reading, the story goes on. One by one, a servant comes in, rushing in to meet Job. The first one tells him that all of his oxen and donkeys were stolen. The second one says that fire came down from heaven and burned up all of his sheep and his shepherds. Another one says that a raiding party took all of his camels. In just one fell swoop, all of his animals, all of his servants are gone. And finally, a messenger comes in and tells him that his 10 children were crushed in a storm. And that last blow is just devastating, devastating. How will Job react to all of this? At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb Naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So, in his deepest moment of agony, Job turns his heart heavenward. It says, Did you catch that there? Job worshiped. Now, don't misunderstand this word. Um, just because Job worshipped does not mean that he started joyfully singing hallelujah when he heard news of this tragedy. Turns out the word worship actually has a deeper and richer spectrum of emotion than what we're used to today. Turns out anguished lament can also be a form of worship as long as it is directed Godward. And then Job says maybe the most famous line in the entire book, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. It's a line that gets used in funerals a lot, right? Let's talk about that line. Job's humility is very admirable here, but is his statement accurate? Is it good theology? Just because Job said it in your Bible doesn't mean that it's true, because Job is going to go on to say a lot of other things, and some of them definitely aren't true. So, So what do you think of this? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Did the Lord take away? Well, God took away his hedge of protection, right? But did God do this to Job? Did God destroy his life and kill his children? I mean, explicitly, no. We talked about this already. It wasn't God's idea. It wasn't God's hand at work. However, that last verse, let's be fair, does say that Job did not charge God with wrongdoing by what he said. So maybe by him saying the Lord takes away doesn't imply that God is culpable for the bad things that have happened to him. But what do you think? We're going to talk about this more in a future week, but here's what I want to say for right now. I don't have an easy answer for you. But what I want to point out is that I think Job is trying to have an easy answer here. There is complexity to how God works in the world that Job is trying to oversimplify here. And while the story commends him for not speaking against God, we're going to see that this posture that he has right here is not sustainable. He is going to start to crack under the emotional pressure of what he's feeling. So moving on, at this point, Satan has been proven wrong in the story. Job had more faith and more integrity than what he expected. So at the next divine council meeting, Satan comes into God's throne room, tail between his leg, and 
and legs, he has two legs. <laughs> uh, and God tells him, hey, what about my servant Job? Have you considered him? There's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, maybe you've noticed. A man who fears God and shuns evil, and he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. So actually, a better way to translate that last phrase there, without any reason, would be without just cause. So God is even saying flat out, Job's suffering is unjust. He does not deserve this. Satan's not convinced, though. Skin for skin. A man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, he will surely curse you to his face, to your face. So Satan says, hey, Job might be resilient, but deep down, he is selfish like everyone else. Hit him with the suffering and he'll crack. Well, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. Again, if you're bothered by this, don't feel bad. My advice to you would be invest those questions you have into the story as you read it. So, verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. That line about scraping with the pottery shard is the grossest thing I can imagine. Uh, yuck. Now, if you're Job right now, what are you thinking? What are you feeling right now? I mean, if everything in your life was taken away from you in an afternoon, and now you've turned into a human scab, wouldn't you be tempted to think that this is some form of divine judgment? I mean, even if that's not part of your worldview already, how could you not think that? Well, it's here in the story that Mrs. Job enters the scene. His wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. Now, historically, Job's wife has been treated very uncharitably. She makes one appearance in the story, and it's only to rebuke her husband. Curse God and die. It's her one line that she gets. And because she gets so little to say and do here, I've heard preachers be so flippant about her. Oh, Satan knew how to make Job suffer, took his children and left his wife. <laughs> Augustine even calls her the devil's accomplice. I think that these kinds of comments are so ungracious and honestly a little misogynistic. Job's wife is not some silly, faithless woman who is tempting her husband to fail a test. She is a mother who is experiencing unimaginable tragedy. And I think what she deeply wants in this moment is to hear from the Job that will appear 30 chapters later. The Job that will ask questions of God and will vent his frustrations. She is understandably hurt and angry in this moment. And what has her husband said so far? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. May his name be praised. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can understand why she would resent her husband's piety. Now, that does not mean that she is right to say this, but I think that we don't want to just dismiss her as a tool of the devil. Job replied to her, you're talking like a foolish woman. Should we not accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. So far in the story, this is as far as we're going to get today, so far in the story, Job is handling this with incredible strength. Right? He's got deep, unwavering faith. But there's more to the book. The stage is set, and we are actually just getting started. What follows from here are 40 dense chapters of poetry. Ideas will get unpacked slowly. Emotions will spike high and low. And after a while of reading this, you're going to start to think, why can't my Bible just be straightforward. Just give me an answer and be done with it. But you know, maybe the pace and the length of this book is meant to teach us something. That there is no shortcut through grief. 
There's no quick answer that is going to take your pain away. If you're troubled by God allowing the death of Job's children, then you're exactly where the author wants you to be. You should be bothered. If you're wondering why a good and just God would allow this to happen, then pull up a chair and sit next to Job. Because with enough time and enough terrible counseling, Job is going to start to wonder these same things as well. One commentator said that this book stirs up two kinds of questions. You've got armchair questions and wheelchair questions. So armchair questions are the things that we like to speculate about from afar. Abstract notions of human suffering and God's justice. Wheelchair questions are the aching burdens of someone in pain. First person experiences of some of Job's hardship. Now, I don't know which kind of questions you brought with you today, if any. Maybe you're really engaged with this subject intellectually. This is a tricky, puzzly thought experiment, and you would love to know how to think rightly about this. If that's you, I am so glad that you're here. I hope that you will continue to stick around in weeks to come. But maybe all of this is hitting you more deeply, more emotionally, because these dilemmas are not abstractions. They are your waking reality. You're struggling to know what God is up to in the mess of your life. You're wondering where it is that he went. If that's you, I want you to know that your questions are valid, and I hope that you will take them to God and to his word. But I do want you to have the right expectations, Many find the ending of the book of Job to be emotionally unsatisfying. And that's because the questions that we often bring to this book are not always the questions that it's trying to answer. We want to know why God allows suffering, but this book is really about whether or not God can be trusted. Can God be trusted? And here's what I'll tell you. The more that you sit with this book, I'm not talking just over an afternoon. I'm saying over the course of years. The more that you sit with this book, the more you will find that this is the question that really matters. Can God be trusted even when his ways are a mystery? So, as we close, I want to leave you with some more questions to think about or to talk about with someone. Maybe you're going on a hike this afternoon. You can talk about some of these things. So I invite you, you can write these down. You can take a picture of the screen. Think about some of these things today, throughout this week. I want you to register what you are thinking and feeling as we engage with this story. So I'll just go through them. How do you feel about the scenes in heaven? Why do you think they are included in our version of the story of Job? How would Job feel if he knew what was happening in heaven? Would it help? Are there parts of this story that bother you? How do you feel about Job's response in suffering? And that last question is the one that I really want you to think about going forward throughout this series. How are Job and Jesus connected? Job is described as righteous and blameless. God calls him my servant. And then he endures unimaginable suffering. Hmm. Can you think of another suffering servant in your Bible? So the question is, how does the story of Job illuminate the story of Jesus? And how does the story of Jesus help us to navigate the story of Job? Well, we left our friend Job with some unanswered questions, and I'm going to leave you with some unanswered questions as well. Would you bow your heads for prayer? Father in heaven, Uh, Part of life is questions and doubts, and I thank you so much that we have uh, a long and thorough book that wrestles with these things. There are not easy answers to make our um, questions go away, but I believe that the longer we spend time with you, with your word, and with each other, our questions can start to change and evolve and our pain can start to fade in light of what we learn about you. I pray that you give us perseverance and faithfulness in our own struggles. pray this in your name. Amen.